Fellow delegates, my name is Paul Larson. I'm from High Performance Sport New Zealand. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm chairing the next two sessions. Uh, we'll start with um, just, the, just introducing the very first section. All right, we've got Margo and Sergio to start us off. Um, I just, uh, I will introduce um, Dr. Margo Mountjoy. Margo is a sports physician in Canada, fellow Canadian. Uh, and in, um, she works with uh, Triathlon Canada. Um, and interestingly, she's just completed her PhD defense um, in, the, in the health area, the area that she'll be um, speaking on today. So the title of her presentation uh, is Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport. Very important area. Uh, please welcome uh, Margot Mountjoy. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Sergio, and to the ITU for inviting me here to Paris to speak on this topic. It is a pleasure to be in Paris and to address after Magligan, be back amongst triathlon uh, to work on this topic. So how much is too much? That's a very big question. We can say it's a loaded question. And while I will hopefully provide some ideas and insight, I'm not sure there is a very clear, definitive answer at the end of this talk. Nonetheless, I hopefully will give you lots to think about and to consider when you're training your athletes and working day to day at the swimming pool, running, and on the bike. So I will ask your questions. Is your athlete performing to their maximum? Do your athletes have recurrent injuries or infections? Are you doing everything that you should be doing or can be doing to ensure that they have maximum, maximizing their health and performance outcomes? I've break, broken down my talk today in, in a few areas. First of all, let's just talk about what it is. What is relative energy deficiency in sport? How does this relate to the male athlete? What are some of the health and performance implications if your athlete has this, this syndrome? And I'll introduce the IOC clinical assessment tools, so to give you something practical that you can use in uh, looking after your athletes on a daily basis. And finally, to sum up, I'll do some case studies and summarize the IOC recommendations in this area. So let's start off with the definition. What is relative energy deficiency in sport? To start off with describing what it is, we have to look at where it came from. And this science began back in the United States with some work done by Barbara Drinkwater in 1986, where she noted that Female athletes that had menstrual disturbances also had low bone mineral density. So that was the beginning of the work in this area. And as you know, in 1992, the American College of Sports Medicine defined the syndrome of female athlete triad, which at that time consisted of an eating disorder, complete amenorrhea, and the maximum of osteoporosis. Thankfully, the science did evolve as it does over time. And in 2007, an update by the American College introduces the concept that the cause was low energy availability and that there was a continuum of, from the healthy athlete to the extreme of the, what the original triad was. So an athlete can fall anywhere along that continuum and that there was interconnectivity or interrelationship uh, between the parameters that they were connected and influential on each other. And I think we all recognize the female athlete triad. How many people in the room have had uh, female athletes with the triad in triathlon? Just with the show of hands. 
Yeah, it exists, and, and in particular in our female athletes. It was generally agreed, and the science is pretty solid, that the underpinning factor, the etiology of this, is an energy deficiency. And this is relative to the energy intake, so as in food, compared to the expenses. And when I'm working with athletes, I use the bank account because all athletes seem to understand about being overdrawn in their bank account. So relative energy deficiency is like being overdrawn in the bank account of energy. So the energy intake is the income, the energy output is the expenses. And the expenses are not just exercise, we actually expend energy with our heart beating and general body metabolism, as well as walking to and from school or work or picking up groceries, running up and down the stairs. So there's expenses beyond just sport and all of these must be taken into account. So if we look at the balance, it is the energy availability. It's calculated by the energy intake minus the expense or cost of exercise relative to fat-free mass. And in healthy adults, it's 45 kilocalories per fat-free mass per day. And that equates fairly consistently across males and females across all population as being energy balance. So what happens uh, in the athlete where this energy balance isn't met? Well, over time, since science is evolving, we're finding that this energy deficit not only occurs in females, that males also can be affected by this problem. We also know that people can have this problem who don't consider themselves an athlete. So it can also happen in performing artists. It can also happen in people who are physically active who wouldn't dare to consider themselves an elite athlete. But they're fairly active, recreational, um, physically active people. And the science is such that, that the IOC working group believes that it's well beyond a triad. The effects on the body are far beyond just menstrual function and bone health. There are many other physiological and psychological parameters affected by the energy deficiency. So as such, in 2014, the IOC introduced a broader term. It's larger and more comprehensive, which includes the original female athlete triad, and it is known as relative energy deficiency in sport. And it's defined as a syndrome repaired to impaired physiological functioning caused by relative energy deficiency and includes but is not limited to many of the parameters that I'll discuss. Let's talk about this syndrome in the male athlete. Before I go on, how many people think they've seen it in their male athletes? A few, okay, good. I encourage you all to go home after my talk and start looking for it in your male athletes. I looked after triathlon for many years before I did this project with the IOC, and I had none in my male athletes. Well, I shouldn't say none. I had several of the athletes when they came in. I said, I I'm afraid, John, that I have to tell you you have the female athlete triad. And of course, they would look at me like I was crazy because John was not a female athlete, and he certainly didn't have any menstrual dysfunction. So, you know, I'm actually really happy now that I can actually say to my male athletes who have this concern, um, we, you have something that's not the female athlete triad. Don't look up the menstrual dysfunction. But more importantly, I'm working with my entire male squad, both in my elite triathlon and my elite track and field, as well as my elite swimmers, on preventing energy deficiency in my male and female athletes so that we don't have health or performance implications for Rio and beyond. So let's look at some of the evidence. If we look at actual low energy availability in males, there is good evidence in cyclists that there is severely reduced at eight kilocalories for fat-free mass per day. And I'll remind you that um, energy balance is 45 kilocalories. So cyclists, male cyclists, do have evidence of low energy availability. Jockeys who have low energy availability for other reasons, from food restriction as opposed to energy expenses, 
they experience the outcomes from low energy availability documented in the science. If we look at hormonal dysfunction in male athletes, we do see an interruption of the gonadotrophin releasing hormones and luteinizing hormone pulsatility as well as lower sex hormones in the male athlete in several studies. If we look at reproductive, we see reproductive impairment in male endurance athletes that are training high volumes. Again, evidence that the high volumes in the endurance training can cause effect of the testosterone uh, access for sperm, spermatogenesis, again, in several different studies. If we look at the prevalence of eating disorders and disordered eating in male athletes, in cycling it's as high as 50%. Weight category sports, 18%. Gravitational sports, 24%. Team sports, lower. And technical sports, lower. Now, these numbers in male athletes are less than in female athletes. Nonetheless, they're still available. We still need to pay attention to sordid eating and eating disorders in our male athletes. If we look at bone health in athletes with low energy availability, we know that disordered eating and eating disorders do have lower bone mass in male athletes and that the low energy availability alters the endocrinological function of the bone. Similarly, that we see in females. But what about those male athletes that don't have an eating disorder or disordered eating? What's their bone mineral density like? So if we look at a population of uh, endurance athletes, including cyclists, runners, and triathletes, so these are healthy male triathletes without an eating disorder, without disordered eating. And they had greater risk of low bone mineral density than healthy controls. So this is very counterintuitive to me. If you have someone who's weight-bearing exercise, we know that an athlete or an individual who has weight-bearing exercise will have stronger and more dense bones. If we look at a tennis player, the bone density in their racket arm is significantly higher than in their non-racket arm. So we would expect endurance athletes that are weight-bearing, triathlon, and runners, to have a higher bone mineral density than the general population. Yet, what we see in these studies that our male athletes, that are endurance athletes, have lower bone density. So what is the cause and what is the reason of this? So let's talk about some of the health implications and performance implications. When I speak with athletes, not many of the women care too much about whether they have a period or not. In fact, most of them don't want it. But if I tell them, do you want to swim faster? Do you want to run faster? I can help you with that. Most of them pay attention then. So there are both health and performance implications. We all know that a healthy athlete's going to perform better. And we all want our athletes to be healthy adults once they retire from sport. But if I want to engage an athlete in the conversation, they are more likely to pay attention if I talk about performance here and now, because most of them are fairly narrow vision, and life after sport doesn't exist in, in their importance. So just a little tip to encourage your athletes to engage. Don't talk about menstrual function in the future or their bone density when they're 60 talk about the performance now. So here's a, a, a diagram that the IOC has put in the publications. This, this diagram is meant to be used to show um, some of the health implications of relative energy deficiency. So in the center, you will see relative energy deficiency as being the underpinning cause. From there, there are the different health body systems that are affected, and we've superimposed the triad to show the original um, body systems shown by the female athlete triad. So you can see from this diagram it goes well beyond the original parameters described. I'd like to draw your attention to the psychological um, uh, pink bubble on the one side. This is the only one that has two arrows. And that's to depict the fact that the abnormal psychology can actually cause the energy deficiency through a disordered eating or eating disorder as well as the energy deficiency can cause the psychological problem. So that's, that's why that one in particular is unique. Now please bear in mind that not all athletes have all of the parameters affected at any one time. 
That's not what this is trying to depict. Nor does this diagram show the interconnectivity or causation or interrelationship between these different parameters. It's strictly meant to show the possibilities of the body systems affected. So let's talk about a few of these in particular. If we look at menstrual function, there is some concern with, with prolonged energy deficiency of long-term fertility problems. Functional hypothalamic amenorrhea is, is probably the pathognomonic menstrual dysfunction that's seen in this, in this group. And as well, for some athletes, the emotional impact of having a disturbed system is significant. Uh, some people are, some women are quite disturbed by the menstrual dysfunction. If we look at bone, we know that hypoestrogenemia does have a negative impact on bone health in particular. But we also ha know that low energy availability affects bone density irrespective of estrogen. There are other biological markers that affect bone health outside of the uh, hormonal system, the, uh, the sex hormone system. And really importantly, we know that these athletes are increased risk of stress fracture. Now, how many in the room have had stress fractures in their athletes? Yeah, I have. I Come on, I'm not the only one. Uh, we do know that, that, that our athletes are at risk of stress fracture. In fact, Sergio will be speaking on stress fracture in the next talk. If we look at the cardiovascular system, we know that energy deficient people have endothelial dysfunction within the uh, coronary arteries as well as abnormal lipid metabolism. If we look at the endocrine system, we know there's a reduction of glucose utilization in the energy deficient athlete, mobilization of fat stores, and a slowing of the basal metabolic rate. Finally, a decreased production of growth hormone. All of these systems are affected by the energy deficiency. Other health implications of the central nervous system, GI system, and renal system, all affected by decreased energy availability. And if we look at nutrient deficiencies, quite often, if, especially if there's energy restriction, there'll be nutrient restrictions subsequent to that. And, and I have seen in athletes anemia, of course, chronic fatigue, and I'm talking about fatigue beyond just um, hard training and endurance training, but chronic fatigue that doesn't recover, and an increased risk of infection from nutrient deficiency. Psychological implications. Athletes have been reported to have to report stress, depression, anxiety, and of course, the whole disordered eating and eating disordered psychological sequelae are quite pronounced, severe, and affect not only health, but as well performance. So let's turn our attention now to some of the performance consequences. Some of these are fairly solid in science, and some of them are proposed at the moment. And it is my hope and the hope of the IOC working group that this will stimulate further research in this area to further delineate more solidly some of these performance uh, consequences. I think one of the most important studies, and if, if someone can have a favorite study, this is mine, and I must be a science geek to have a favorite study, but this is my favorite study. And this is one which, which actually talks about performance outcomes of low energy availability. And this is a study of Van Heest from the US, where she took um, teenage sw swimmers, and this was a cohort of young females, of which half of them were found to be ovarian suppressed, secondary to low energy availability. So half of these female athletes had non-functioning ovaries with uh, amenorrhea and hormonal parameters to show that their hormonal system to the, the ovaries was shut down. The other half of the athletes were healthy athletes, and I define healthy as being normal menstrual function, normal hormonal parameters, so the healthy female athlete. These swimmers were put in the swimming pool and given a time trial. Then these swimmers, both groups in the same pool, at the same time, with the same coach, were given the same training program for a period of time. And at the end of that time period, they were again given a swim trial to see how much they had responded to the training stimulus. And we would hope and expect that the swimmers got faster from the training program. And you can see the green uh, box which shows in the healthy menstruating females, they had an 8.2% improvement in their swimming times over the training period. Wonderful. This is exactly what we want when we give our athletes a training stimulus. We expect them to improve their performance. You can see the red box. 
This red box is the ovarian suppressed cohort. These athletes ended up being over 9% slower at the end of the time trial. So this is a, an example of how um, response to endurance training can be affected by low energy availability. So other performance consequences. We do know that people with low energy availability have increased number of viral infections. Can you imagine you have trained for 12 to 15 years of your life, you come to Rio and you get an infection and you have a viral um, cold at the time of your event. You have trained for years. A lot of money, time, effort, emotion has gone into your race and you get an infection. And there's not a lot you can do about it at that point. Not a lot you can do. What we can try and do is prevent them. And we do know that if we can do anything to prevent a viral infection around our um, performance and training. I don't know about you, but I don't really want my athletes having seven to 10 days off because they've got a viral infection during a training period. So what we can do to prevent viral infections is very important. And one of the things we can do amongst proper hygiene and proper nutrition is to make sure that we've got good balance of energy. As well, injuries are increased in those with low energy availability. That's fairly solid uh, in the science. And there's nothing more frustrating in the training of a triathlete than to develop an injury. It takes time away from training and or competition. As well, some of the disordered eating and eating disorder behaviors have significant consequences on the ability to perform. If you have electrolyte disturbances, volume depletions, some athletes take substances that help them lose weight and those cause anti-doping rule violations. Some of the weight loss uh, supplements have uh, prohibited substances in them. That's certainly a very good way to affect your performance. And as well, the GI disturbance is affected um, with athletes having to have gastrointestinal dysfunction while they're training can affect not only performance as well in training, but as well in competition. So I'm going to introduce now the REDS clinical assessment tool. So this is the, the IOC decided that it's great to have a paper, but if we want to translate it into practice, we need to give people something practical that you can use to help you in your daily uh, work with your athletes. So we subsequently to the original consensus published this clinical assessment tool, and we're calling it the REDS CAT, similar to the SCAT of the sport concussion assessment tool, so the REDS CAT. And it's based upon the red, yellow, and green light uh, phenomenon where we have, uh, first of all, this is what the publication looks like, very similar to the concussion SCAT, and it is in a similar format. I don't expect you to be able to read this. I show you just so that you will visualize it when you um, download it from the British Journal of Sport Medicine website. The first page talks much about what I discussed already. The second page is the actual um, assessment tool. And the third page is a sample contract with which you can use to contract with your athlete for treatment. So again, this is all available on, in the REDS CAT that you can download. So the concept, I think, is fairly simple. Uh, this is adapted from the Norwegian, the Oslo Sport Trauma Center. They have been using this in practice for up to five years now. And it's based on red, yellow, and green light stratification of your athletes. So again, I don't expect you to read the details, but you can imagine that the red, the athlete following your assessment ends up in the red zone if they have severe consequences or severe health problems that eliminates their ability to perform healthy in their sport. The yellow light are those that you should have caution, you should be paying attention to, and these are athletes that have signs and symptoms of reds, but aren't severe enough to remove them from sport. The green zone, if your athletes are in the green zone, congratulations, they're completely healthy and they have no signs or symptoms of relative energy deficiency. So stemming from this, you can imagine that the red light, if your athlete lands up stratified into the red light area, their clearance to sport participation is denied. And this is actually a very important tool because removing an athlete from training is a very difficult thing to do. And unless you have something to say, here's why, it can be sometimes politically challenging to remove an athlete from training when they actually should be removed from training for their health risk. 
because it's a risk to their health or others around them to have them actually training and competing. So this model gives you an ability to say, oh, look, you're in this criteria and the, the IOC guidelines say you shouldn't be training, so you're not training until we can make an improvement. If your athlete is stratified into the yellow area, that's the caution area, they can continue to train once you've cleared them uh, from a medical point of view, and they must train and compete under supervision, re-evaluating them at regular intervals, that might be one month or three months, depending on the clinical scenario, and they must be compliant in their reassessments. So you want to see that the athlete is, is not only compliant with what they're doing, but they're progressively improving. So this is the yellow caution zone. So they can continue under supervision. And of course, the athlete that's stratified to the green area is completely uh, free to train and compete uh, according to uh, normal standards. So once you've had the athlete off or you've been involved with them, how do we return them to play? When is it okay for them to come back and when should they come back? So we have ad adapted the Creighton model, which is common to all sports for return to play, and we've adapted the criteria for reds. And again, it would be difficult on these screens to see. The first parameter you must evaluate, of course, is the medical health parameters. And this is where you stratify them from a yellow, red, or green, as I noted before. The second area you look at is um, the participation or risk modifiers of their sport. If this athlete is in archery, they'll come back a lot faster than if they're in triathlon. If this athlete is in, a, in a, um, a sport where there's physique involved, like synchronized swimming, or in a judged sport like figure skating, there's a higher risk in those sports than, say, um, a sport that's not in uh, physique involved. Triathlon, with the endurance component, is one of the higher risk sports. And then the third thing, there are other decision modifiers that we like to think aren't involved in sport but are, and that is uh, pressure from teams, pressure from finances, pressure from other components. So all of these factors are taken into involve in the return to play decision model that physicians make with um, athletes. Then you re-stratify your athlete back into these three zones. Have they gotten worse? Are they in the red area now? Are they still in the yellow area, made improvement but we need to continue? Or have they now progressed and they're in the green area? And I find this model works well with athletes in particular. They seem to understand the concept. Coaches seem to understand the concept, and they want to see progression and movement. But it also, I think, importantly gives you, when you're working with athletes, a model to um, very clearly define what your athletes should and can be doing with respect to training. So let's illustrate this with a case study. 23-year-old male athlete. He presents to my office with fatigue, significant declining performance, and recurrent soft tissue injury, and in particular, he had a stress fracture. And he was new to my squad. I did not have previous parameters on him, and I said, well, before, what was your strategy? What did you do? He said, you know, when my performance got worse, I trained harder. I trained more, because obviously I wasn't training hard enough, so I trained longer, and I trained harder. His height was 190 centimeters, weight of 75 kilometer, uh, kilometers, kilograms, very fast man. Uh, he also was on medication for an affective disorder for depression. Uh, and he had uh, no suicidal ideation or attempts, but he was certainly depressed when I met him. He was then, at that point, stratified into the yellow category. He was allowed to continue to train at lower volumes, um, but very, very much lower volumes and we were monitoring a number of parameters. We monitored his weight and body composition over time, moving forward, and you can see he significantly went up during the end of his time period, and what he was doing before was he had a competition body composition for the entire training period. He did not cycle his body composition, and he was at competition all the time. So we introduced the ability for him to train differently with respect to his body composition. And you can see his testosterone numbers originally when I first took it was 16.5. He did not have any functioning testosterone in my opinion and in his. And you can see over time that it improved very much significantly and he was not only a much healthier athlete but a much happier athlete uh, with treatment. His performance uh, really improved unbelievably through the course of treatment over a year and he 
I removed his antidepressant within three to five months of the, of the implement, intervention, and he's remained off antidepressants and is performing very, very well. So we're very happy with his progress. I'll present a second study, and this is a 24-year-old female elite triathlete. She had a history of two stress fractures, and she decided to go on a, a weight loss diet, a paleo diet. I don't know if any of you know that, but you shouldn't be working with a paleo diet with your athletes because she wanted to improve her performance and thought she'd do so with a paleo diet. And she lost about 15 pounds, but she did actually improve in the short term. Her performance did improve with this weight loss. She presented with uh, shin pain, and at that point, her performance was starting to plateau. So although she had an initial improvement with her weight loss, it was not sustained. She had a hormonal IUD in place for birth control, which is most unfortunate. Uh, not unfortunate from the perspective of pregnancy control, it works very well, but most unfortunate from my ability to monitor her hormones because they're altered, unfortunately, exogenously from the hormone in her IUD. Fairly healthy uh, height and weight at that point. Her bone mineral density was quite low for an athlete. Her hormone function, as I mentioned, was difficult to assess. She had suppression in her white blood cell counts and other hormonal factors. She had an estimated intake of energy of quite low, and she was training for two to four hours a day. She did not have any disordered eating type behaviors, but she certainly wasn't even eating anything prior to her swims in the morning. So she had a very poor uh, management program with respect to eating around her training. And she was not always eating after her workouts for recovery either. So there was lots of issues here that we could work with. So she was also categorized into the yellow area and was put on a treatment plan. Uh, we increased her energy intake uh, to reach a point where she was in energy balanced and we were able to allow her to continue and train and compete. This is a slow process. This is not an easy fix. And she, con she continued with subpar results, although she maintained her energy balance. Unfortunately, she was lost to um, moving to another continent, and uh, subsequently at the other continent, she developed another stress fracture in her femur this time. So not a happy story, one that we needed to be done differently. And I illustrated to say it's not always black and white, it's not always easy, and sometimes there's other factors that you have to take in, into place. And I think having the athlete with you and to be able to monitor them is very important because remotely across continents by email is not sufficient. You need to have them with you and to make sure they're engaged in following the treatment program. Uh, she did have a, um, her resting metabolic rate did improve nicely. Uh, she did remain uh, hypoestrogenemic and was feeling well until she developed the next, um, the next stress fracture. So we'll sum up with some of the IOC recommendations from this REDS, and really it's a, meant to be a call to action for everyone here in the room to please go home and look for it, because if you don't look for it, you might not see it. So when you're seeing your athlete that comes in who's fatigued, or maybe not performing well, or has an injury, or it seems to be getting more illnesses than you expect, think about this and look for it. So for the athlete entourage, for all of us in here, we should be implementing prevention education programs for our athletes and the importance of, in particular, nutrition, energy balance in training. De-emphasizing weight as a performance parameter. Nobody won a medal for having the lowest weight in the category. What you do want is someone who swims faster, runs faster, and cycles faster. So if I can prove to my athletes that by gaining three to five pounds, through increasing their energy intake, allows them to run faster, it's okay not to be as skinny as the person next to you as long as you're faster than them. That's what's most important, is whether you get to the end of the line faster, not whether you have three pounds less than the person beside you. And avoid critical comments from a coaching perspective and from a sports science perspective about body shape. Increasing athletes' awareness of nutrition, but particularly to look at um, safe sources of information and open communication about uh, nutrition. For sport organizations, for triathlon, for swimming, for track and field, are we preventing educational programs at our level? Rule modifications to modify weight categories and policies for coaches on healthy weighing of athletes. 
or coaches not weighing athletes and having the sports science team do it in a very secure and safe manner. For healthcare professionals, for those of us working with athletes on our support team, who is in our support team that can handle the psychological component, that can handle the nutrition, the physiology, and the medical aspects? Making sure that our team is well educated on it and that they implement the specific um, a periodic health examination as well as the return to play Reds cat. And finally, in closing, I would like to thank my co-authors from the IOC who worked with me on these projects and were very instrumental in bringing this project together. Thank you very much. Thank you.